Hey, today I'm going to have some sort of printf function to kind of have an alternative or maybe eventually replace the current printing in the OS with an explicit cursor X and Y parameter that has to be passed in to print like anything at all. I want to kind of simplify that a little bit and do sort of the C way with the, the standard IO header and using printf. So I'll have a simple printf that I want to do without using variable arguments because I'm doing this from scratch. I don't have var args or anything. And in 32-bit mode, that's fairly easy. You just kind of take whatever's supposed to be on the stack according to some way of knowing what's on the stack. And for printf, that's a, a character string for a, the format string, like with the percent sign, percent %d is int, percent %s is string, you know, stuff like that. So if we can read that format string and then go up the stack of arguments, because in plain 32-bit that I'm in, in C declare, we're going to have, you know, plain arguments on the stack, RTL, right to left. So we can just look through those in the format string and read them out. So I think we'll be able to do that. I want to try to do that today as well as have like a sort of basic write syscall to file descriptor 1. And uh, I don't have any file descriptor tables or anything set up, but what I can do is sort of emulate... A terminal driver maybe well, maybe not really a driver I'll just have a, a file for terminal functions that I can abstract writing to a file through and just have the write syscall be in the kernel and then if we call printf that'll end up calling write so we can have sort of writing to a file just abstracted only in one place needing inside assembly inline assembly and only one place it's needed at like in the kernel so yeah I'm just hopefully this will be a shorter video today just showing a basic printf and writes this call and things. Uh, but all right, this is a basic example, you know, outside the OS. But this is kind of what, what I'm going to envision that I'm going to do here. A test case for a string and an integer here. String and an integer. Um, I actually don't need all of these parentheses now that I think about it. You can just dereference the pointer here and it'll be read properly. You know, point, uh, taking the data from a pointer to character pointer for the string. But anyway, basically we have an argument that's going to be on the stack starting off this ellipses here without variable arguments. I have a constant character format string. So we're going to read through that string. And if we encounter a percent sign, we read the next thing to check what type are we trying to print out. But if it's not a percent sign, we'll just, you know, put the character that's there. Uh, but starting at the first argument after this point is where we would have these percent sign arguments ideally like this example here at the uh, at the bottom just printing a test integer 77 a test string for hello so we would have this full string with the literal characters percent and d and comma and the new line and the new line would be one character but you know these literal characters and this whole string makes up this format string at the top so as we read through this string at the bottom you know, we don't find anything, we're going to print the T, E, S, T, space, I, N, T, colon, space. But we find a percent, we're going to go through here while we're reading through. Okay, we found a percent, we'll iterate past that. We'll switch on whatever the character following the percent sign is. In this case, it'll be a D. This isn't truly printf from scratch because I'm calling printf for this example, but that's just to show that we can print an integer here because we found an integer. So I'm taking wherever the current argument is, which is a pointer I set to... The address of format, <laughs> so they're both character pointers, just to have a one byte arithmetic by default here. Um, I'm taking a pointer to the address of format. If I just took format, then it would be reading this string, and we want to read stuff on the stack where the address of format is and the address of the other variables. They'll be on the stack. So we take a pointer to the address of that, and then we iterate past it with just a size of character pointer. This will be probably whatever the address size is on your machine. If, if I compile for 32-bit, this is going to be probably four bytes for regular pointer size, but um, that's fine. What this really is saying is that on the stack, this character pointer argument is going to take up the amount of bytes that a character pointer would. So that's why I'm iterating with that size. Okay, but anyway, we're going to read through. If we find a percent, we found a D. I'm just going to say, okay, the argument is supposed to be an integer, so I'm going to change our character pointer to an integer pointer and take the data from that. So that's going to take an integer value from this argument pointer on the stack, and I'm just going to print it out and iterate past that argument by taking the size of an integer. 
and then we'll read through, we'll print out the rest of the string, we get to percent %s, we say, okay, that's a string. <laughs> a string is a character pointer, so I guess I did a pointer to a character pointer here. We're getting a character pointer to a character pointer effectively, so I'm kind of having to dereference twice and get the data from that for the string, which is a character pointer. And then we're just gonna print the string, which will iterate through that string effectively. Um, and then increment past the size of that. If we had other stuff on the stack, then we would go on to print that. But this is just a small example that I could come up with. Um, so if I compile that with this, uh, I need to do 32-bit because in 64-bit, you actually have to worry about calling conventions and which arguments are passed and which registers. For 32-bit, for this, it's all a C declare calling convention. So everything's just on the stack right to left. But if I was in 64-bit or wanted to compile for 64-bit, this would be a little more involved because you would have to know your System 5 ABI or your Microsoft standard call, vector call, what have you. You'd have to know your calling convention. So if you knew your calling convention, then you would have to probably keep track of the argument number that you're on and then the type. So if we add an integer type that we found with the percent %d and say we're at argument 2 or 3, then you would, you know, look at your calling convention and maybe try inline assembly, <laughs> maybe do this without any optimization so stuff doesn't get too wacky too fast. Do this for 64-bit and say, okay, maybe this is supposed to be an ECX or EDX, so I'll take it from there in inline assembly. But 32-bit, it's really easy. That's why I'm doing this in 32-bit right now because it's a simple example to show. But just, you know, compile it with dash n32 for 32-bit code, and I'll name this the same thing. And I already did this before, so, you know, no errors. And if we print that out, then we get our test. Test int 77 string hello. I know I'm calling print printf within this my printf function, but this is just to show that we can access the arguments on the stack, and they are, you know, these this type and this size. So we know we're finding it correctly because it's printing out correctly. So that's just a small example of kind of what I'm gonna do for my operating system, although it'll be a bit longer and slower <laughs> and more involved because I won't have a printf already. So I'll have to print out an integer by converting the digits to ASCII or what have you and print into the screen, so, stuff like that. And I'm probably just gonna do percent %d, percent %s, percent %c for character. That may be all I'm doing, maybe a percent %x for hex. That's probably all I'm gonna be doing, that and like a simple write sys call that printf calls. So we'll go on with that. Okay, so to start out this printf stuff and all, I'm going to make the write syscall first, sort of a template skeleton write syscall that'll just say, okay, if we pass this syscall a fd number of one, we'll just call some other terminal write function, which really you'd want to look through probably a process table for open file descriptors and somehow get the relevant write function to use through that, maybe through virtual file system call or something, which is, I think, in a file structure. Stuff I've been reading about but can't uh, go into detail because, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, um, yeah, I'll make sort of a write syscall first, and then printf will call that write syscall. But before I do that, I'm going to make <laughs> a little tiny abstraction here just to have our syscall numbers sort of in one place, and then user code, if they want to call a system call, they can get this number without needing the code, you know, the full code that the kernel has to actually build the system call functions and call them and all. So I'm going to have a, a file for that in Linux. This is like syscalls.h, I think, and then free BSD or open BSD, they're in different areas, maybe under SYS, kern, syscalls or something. Um, it's, it's all like platform dependent. So I'm going to make another folder here, include file, I'm going to call it SYS. And I did touch for a file and not make directory. I'm going to have a couple files. The first one is going to be just to hold the system call numbers. But instead of calling it syscalls.h, I already have a syscalls under interrupts because <laughs> they're software interrupts technically. Um, that would be kind of confusing and that name's kind of generic. So I'm going to call it syscallnumbers.h. That's not ambiguous at all, right? That makes sense. And the other thing I'm going to have is for C functions that just kind of wrap the system calls, wrap the uh, inline assembly for them. So specifically for write, we, we can have a C function wrapper called write, which just calls the system call for write. So I'm gonna call this syscall wrappers. And I was trying to think of something else to say, so my brain went blank a minute. But uh, <laughs> if we look at printf, well, the regular printf's for the shell, so not that. Uh, we can look at write, 
I think it's under two, not three. There we go. The second section in the, the system calls man pages for write. So this is in, they put it in uni standard, which is, I guess, Unix or universal or something. So this is going to be in syscall wrappers.h in my files. So, um, but it's just a wrapper for the, the write system call. It takes in a file descriptor, a buffer, and the number of bytes to write to that buffer, to write to the file from that buffer. But the number for that is going to be in the other file so that maybe if for some reason a user program or you want to write something that just calls directly without going through a wrapper you can you can just get um, the numbers because they might be dynamic the system call numbers may change so i want sort of one place that they're going to be <laughs> hard coded in so that other places can use it and it only changes in, it only changes in one place and it can be more uh, dynamic over time right so we'll do that so syscall numbers dot h uh, be under sys system call numbers sure and yeah I'm just gonna do the sort of max calls here as well and we'll be adding right I think currently there's five but we'll be adding right to that so I already had a syscalls dot h so I'm basically gonna move this line over there is all. And this one will include it. And we'll have six system calls because I'll have one for write, but all that's going to really be in here right now is just an enum. There might be a better way of doing this. Type def the enum so we only <laughs> allow these numbers. That might be better, right? So we only allow the numbers that are in here. I'll just call it system calls, I guess. System call numbers, sure. But the first one here will be. I guess I'll just have it laid out like we already do. So I'll just do syscall test zero. We'll say we'll start it at zero. It'll automatically increment by one. So that's all we need to define. We don't even really need to define it at zero. It'll start at zero. But just for clarity purposes, I'll put all these here. Force me to remember maybe. But we'll have sleep, malloc, free, and I'll have a new one for write. So that should be six. Yeah. All right. So zero and one. Then we have sleep. Which is two. Um, this will be four. Okay, and then we all have we will have malloc. We'll have free. And I'll have one for write. Okay. Yeah, I'll put that down here. Be void, syscall, write. Just do that void. Eventually, I might want to pass arguments to these. Right now, I'm not going to do write system call write bytes from a buffer to a file descriptor. Because so I guess I'll put in FD abstractions eventually. But with this file included, the syscalls.h here, what I can do for the system call table is make it slightly different. And just explicitly say, hey, this is an array of function pointers that take in void. <laughs> so an array of function pointers, however many, are in max syscalls, which is defined over here. These function pointers return void and take in void. I think C99 or C11, one of those two, we have designated initializer. What I can do here is not have these explicitly in this order. I can put these in a different order as long as I put sort of the number that they correspond to in this file, right? So if syscall test zero is zero, I can put syscall test zero, and I can say that equals, well, here we would have one, one equals one, but zero equals zero. So that way we can say, this is kind of convoluted and not in order, but we can say, okay, the first offset in this array, the first index here is going to be this function pointer. The second one is going to be this. Well, the second one visually, but first in the list, because this is at offset zero, because this is zero over here. So it makes more sense if I have it laid out like this, right? But this is just showing with these designated initializers, which I think is what the name is. <laughs> these can be in any order. And you know, people, I'm sure people already knew that, but I was like, oh, this is cool. I didn't know this was there. This makes sense. If we, if we move stuff around or change these numbers or whatever, they'll be changed dynamically. We just have to recompile and they can be in a different order, I think. I guess I'll find out here when I compile if they can be in a different order, but I think this should make things easier. It makes it a little bit more abstracted, but 
I think it makes more sense. Like this is the number for this system call. It's just being very explicit with it. So in my opinion, that's good, but my opinion's very biased since I'm writing it and trying to justify my reasoning, which, you know. Okay, well, we can see if that compiles, though. Um, that file is not found. Did I write this? Oh, I called it syscall numbers. And this I called syscalls, yeah. The file is not found because that file doesn't exist. Of course. Okay, so it does compile. So does it run? Hey, it runs. We're all good. And I messed up the compile, so that's there. Dun, 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 dun. Go here. So yeah, we're we're all good here. Does malloc work? So we're calling system calls and freeing. Okay. Just making sure. Uh, this needs to increase because we have six now. We are returning negative one on failure. Okay. So the, the other thing, this doesn't work in GCC, but it doesn't clang, and it just makes things a little cleaner looking, is that these attribute lists, you can put them, well, you can put them one after another, or you can have them within the same one. So you can have a list of attributes that are comma delimited. So instead of having one for naked and one for interrupt, we can have one for both and just delimit it by comma. So GCC complains that uh, a naked attribute function cannot have interrupts, so this will not compile in GCC, but I do need other changes anyway for that. That's just one thing that doesn't compile in GCC, but it doesn't claim. So that can just make things smaller. If you have a bunch of interrupt or uh, a bunch of function attributes, you can just stick them in one list and it works. So, okay. But now that that's there, if we wanted a user program or you wanted to write something that uses system calls, you could just include this file just to have definitions. So you don't need to include uh, wrappers you can call directly with inline assembly or what have you, because you'll have the numbers available. So that's cool. Uh, but the other file I was doing was syscall wrappers.h. See function wrappers for system calls. And I could write other ones, you know, for these other functions here, something, but I already have ones for malloc and free. So maybe I could move the malloc and free ones also in here. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the main reason I did this wrappers function was because I did not want to have a uni standard because I'm not writing a Unix clone. I didn't want it to be confusing, but I guess I could have put it in uni standard, but I figure if I had one for system call numbers, I could have one for wrappers. Just, I guess it's a catch all. So well, I'll maybe clarify that there. This is, this is a catch all for miscellaneous system calls, not in other files. Or maybe I could include the other files in this one and just have them all in one. I don't know. Anyway, this is only going to have writes right now. And we'll include the numbers file in here just to have that available. But right now it's just going to be write int, uh, I can make it int32. So what do we pass to write? We pass it a file descriptor and a buffer and the number of bytes that we want to write to that file from that buffer. So I'll make that a constant as well, make it a size or length. Length would be fine. So the result of write is supposed to return the number of bytes written, right? Attempts to write n bytes of data. Uh, upon successful completion, the number of bytes which were written is returned, otherwise negative one. An error no is set, which I don't have that. I don't have error number things either. But the number of bytes written supposedly is gonna be returned here, so that's what this variable is gonna hold. I'll default it to I guess I'll default it to negative one. We'll do that. And at the end, we'll return that. But in between, uh, we'll do some inline assembly. So this is a software interrupt. So we'll have a literal calling interrupt 80. On return from this function, EAX should hold from the system calls 
my face is probably covering this. Uh, I don't remember how I move stuff over. Well, that kind of works. <laughs> it's not a great way to do things, but that kind of works. Um, on return from calling a system call, EAX should have the return value. So I call the function, you know, I add four to the stack to skip over whatever was there. And we return, we save EAX at the end. We pushed it to begin with, but we don't pop it. We just add. So it, anyway, EAX should have the value of the system call when this is done. So as a return value here is output, we can get the value. We could specify EAX explicitly. That's fine just to make sure. But I'm going to put that into result. As input to this, we need the FD buffer in length. And for my system calls, EAX holds the system call number. So I'm going to put that as input. It should be syscall write because we're including that header file. I got rid of the other thing because I messed up earlier. Okay, so syscall write and I'll just go down the line of general purpose registers and EBX. I'll put the file descriptor. Uh, ECX will have the buffer and EDX will have the length. And I'll just call write, which I'll have to put inside of our system call file. <laughs> so this will just be a wrapper that calls that. That's all well and good. So, okay, let me make that, I guess, while I'm here. That's why I have this here, this empty file. Empty function, rather. Okay, and actually in this one I'm using these specific link types as well. So I might as well include standard int in here as well. Okay, so inside here, I'm just going to get the file descriptor. I guess I'll default it to zero, maybe. Zero would be standard in, but yeah, whatever. File descriptor, the void pointer buffer that we set up. Default that to null, and we'll have the size, or the length, the number of bytes we want to write from the buffer. So we'll have variables for those. And I will get those values since this was called from inline assembly in those registers. I'll get the values from those registers from uh, A, B, C, and D, or B, C, D in this case. I'll do that here. I, I wish I could get values from them without using like either some kind of uh, useless statement here, just explicitly moving the values. Because I know in, in Inline assembly in this, I can just get the values in the output list, right? But, you know, you still need a statement to run before you do that, I think. Like, I don't think I can have an empty list and then just get them, but maybe I can. Um, like, as output, I would want... From, from the output of this inline assembly, I would want to get the value in EBX into FD. So if I try this... Like, I don't think this will work but I don't know. Can I run an empty statement? Because <laughs> that would make this easier, right? Maybe this will work. I didn't do this when I was testing, so I don't think it'll work, but maybe it will. We'll see. It'd be cool if it did. It looks kind of jank, but it makes things easier. Um, this will be buffer and equals D equal length. We're learning together. That's what's going on here. Okay, so hopefully I get these values into these things, and then I need to call something with that, depending on the value of FD. If we're writing, we need to call a write function that's set up for the file descriptor. And then normally you would go through a file descriptor table and maybe a device list, depending on the descriptor and the file type and things. I don't have any of that set up, so I'm just going to hard code, which is not great. But if FD is one, change to use some sort of open process or calling, It'd be the calling process, right? Calling process, open FD table. I'll just put that as a, as a thing. But if our FD is one, I'm going to call some function to write to standard out. And standard out is some sort of stream abstracted as a file through Linux or Unix, maybe Windows to some extent as well. Um, I don't have streams or things set up, so... My standard I.O. is my screen, or uh, the frame buffer that we have, is going to be my FD1. So I'm going to have a file to write to the frame buffer, which I know I already have, print types and stuff, but I'm going to, you know, do it a little bit differently through this. 
Okay, I'm gonna call a function to write to the screen and I'm gonna sort of call it a terminal driver, but not really a driver, just sort of a function that takes in a string and uh, that string could have control codes like a terminal would. Ultimately what started this was I was wondering how I was gonna write to the screen with printf and keep the same interface that printf has in C, which is not needing explicit cursor parameters for X and Y, right? Cursor position. I was like, how do you set cursor position? So I read up on that and there's uh, terminal control codes and things that you can send as a string, which start with um, a literal escape, which I think is X1B, or they use octal a lot, so it's octal um, 33, but it's, uh, it's hex 1B or decimal 27, right? 16 plus 11, yeah. And that, that is a literal escape. You can also sometimes put it inside of a string. Well, inside of a string, it doesn't say it's wrong. <laughs> it says it's an a character, and this is, you know, decimal 27 in the ASCII table. If your compiler supports it, which mine does, it's counted as escape, the same character. But you send that and you send some other symbol. So I think VT100 or 220, it's like a left bracket and then 33 and then something H or J or whatever. And that sets the cursor position. So you, in the right sys call, what ultimately happens, the right goes through a bunch of indirection <laughs> and ends up at some function that reads this string and says, okay, We'll look at term info, what terminal are you using? We'll say, okay, this corresponds to some function in there that sets the cursor position, and it ultimately ends up working. I want to do something similar, but I'll have different looking escape messages. I'll probably do like, if we want to set the cursor position, I might do something simple like X number, Y number, or whatever, which takes up more bytes, but I mean, that makes more sense to me, right? I'm setting something, or I can call it cursor X, Y. I know I'm getting off topic, but I'm going to do this in a few minutes is why I'm trying to say this. Um, but FD1 is going to write to the terminal and as a return code from this write syscall, from this write function that we'll end up calling, um, the return code needs to be an EAX and an integer. So I'm putting that in inline assembly here. So a large uh, digression for that, but yeah. I'll move something into EAX and that's something. So you can do things a few different ways. I did it like this when I was testing. I had a function called terminal write, which is gonna write for the terminal, which will just be for the screen, for the frame buffer, um, given the buffer in size. Given the buffer in size variables. So AX as input to this inline assembly portion will have the result of calling this function. I'm assuming it returns an integer wherever this function is. We haven't written it yet. Uh, but now that I know this maybe works, if this ends up not working, I'll have to change everything anyway. But if this part works and we can do that, then this would be easier just to have this blank and as output, you know, overwrite EAX with the result of this. Like that's easier to read, right? So I'll try this. If it doesn't work, then, you know, this is a bad <laughs> rabbit hole into trying to make inline assembly read easier. And it probably won't work, but whatever. But if we don't call FD1, all I'm going to do is move like a negative one into EAX. That's, that's fine. We'll say, okay, this isn't really, this isn't really implemented yet. So EAX is going to be negative one, which I, I don't remember if I need a double or a single modulo sign there. Implicit declaration. Yeah, we don't have that. Um, so assume I had this function. <laughs> Expected a string literal. Uh, oh. The error messages get better over time. Or at least I know how to read them faster. So that's good. This isn't going to do anything because we aren't calling right, but I just want to know that um, it boots. So that's good. Okay, we'll do unsupported fd for right. Uh, but let's assume we have this thing that exists, terminal write. I'll have some other file that includes that, I guess. So I need to include it here. We'll put it under terminal. Terminal.h. We'll have terminal driver functions. Some generic abstract thing. So if I wanted to follow a convention in other operating systems, this would be like a, a VT220 driver or something, right? VT100. But I'm just doing terminal. <laughs> Okay, but ultimately calling this write function should call that terminal write 
and should end up writing to the screen eventually. So we'll try and make that happen. But I'll have a terminal folder. All right, I'm going to fill out that file and then I'll get to printf. <laughs> That's why I started with printf so people wouldn't think this is clickbait or something, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll get to it. It'll just be a while. Uh, like everything else I do, but that's okay. Terminal. Uh, we'll call this kind of a generic terminal driver. Functions to write to screen. Uh, okay, we'll probably end up using explicit types. I'll put that in here. Okay. So what do we call it? We called it writes or terminal write or what? Uh, terminal writes. Let's call it that. That'll return an int. Well, we'll do int32. Terminal write, and it'll take in the buffer and the size. So buffer and, or the buffer and the length. Length or size, whatever. Buffer and a length to write. Um, buffer we might change. This will make it constant. So this is going to write to the screen, and this is going to be, in many ways, just a copy, or <laughs> very similar to our current printing. But we're going to have an assumed and implicit cursor XY position, as well as other changes for, like, taking control codes or escape codes. But a lot of it is going to be the same as, you know, like our print character function here. And the first thing I see here is I have this stuff, which I kind of wanted to abstract out. So let me do that. Just delete that. Put it there. There we go. And we'll include it in this file. Addresses. I gave it a super long name, addresses.h. I don't remember how many S's are in that word every time. <laughs> That's okay. And include that here. So I'll be, I'll be probably copying a lot of this logic here and putting it into the terminal function. Um, but some stuff I did a little bit differently, like taking the font width and height. This is a constant. I call it font width in the address table, so it has to be different probably. So font w um, is going to be basically these two things. Let's just copy those over. But we'll do that. Font w, font h, that's fine. And something that I didn't have in the print character, but that I do want to have here is a variable line length, sort of. Like right now, it's kind of hard coded to 80 in our, in our print character. Where is it? Yeah, 80. 80 is the end of the line. I kind of don't want to have that limitation. I wanted to get rid of that eventually, so we'll do that here. But I'll call it X limit and Y limit, I guess. And that's going to be. Uh, I need graphics in here. Put that above there. So that'll be X resolution. And that'll be divided by our font width, right? So if we're doing 1080p, it's 1920 in the horizontal resolution. So 1920 divided by our font width, we'll say our font width is 10, means we can fit 192 characters in a line. So this will be kind of on screen when we're drawing stuff. You may want to limit it in other ways, but for this, I'm just going to have generic. It's not uh, limited except by the screen. So it'll go on, you know, print to the end of, the, end of the, the screen, not just 80 characters, but it can go beyond 80. We'll have a, a similar thing for the Y limit, but it'll be Y resolution and font height. So we'll limit it to 1080 divided by, I don't know, 8 or 10, however, whatever font we have. Um, we also need the bytes per pixel. Do I have that? Yeah. Things that I didn't make constant, but technically they're constant, so 
Okay, but if we want to draw stuff on the screen and we need to keep track of where the position is that we're drawing at, we need to have that stored somewhere. It's not stored in the collar of this function, or maybe it is, uh, but we're going to store it implicitly within here. So I'll just start them at zero, and I need the types. 16-bit, well, I could do 32. 32 may be better for performance reasons on things, just because of how the architecture is, so we'll do that. C, there we go, not R. I'll try it with that, but okay, we'll have an X and Y cursor position. It's passed explicitly to this function over here, it's going to be implicit to this function over here. And then if I want to have other control codes for doing other things, we can add variables for those. So if I want to have codes for, or escape codes, however you call it, if I want to have codes for setting the foreground and background color, I can put those here as well. Just have foreground and background color, which are also in graphics mode, so maybe that would be... I don't know if this will give an error for like duplicate definition or anything. I don't think it will because the scope for this function is outside of graphics, so it shouldn't. Uh, I'm probably worrying about things I don't need to. Foreground would be the color of the text, so let's make it... I guess what I currently have, and that's a little grayer than white. I think it's a few shades darker. So we'll do six. We'll do D's and the background color will be a few shades lighter than black. I'll do twos. So zero, one, two, and then F, E, D. So they should both be two shades away from white and black. Uh, this one I can add the alpha as well. All right, and then if we have something to show the cursor or not show the cursor, call it show cursor. Um, It'd be true or false, so I can make it a bool. Make it a boolean. Do I need other stuff? I do need other stuff set up. <laughs> if I'm going to read through a string and I don't want to mess with the buffer, I guess I can have a thing for that. I don't know if I want to use un8 for, char for uh, strings or character, I guess. It makes more sense and it's explicit if I use un8. But character makes more sense for characters making a string. But I have them type deft, so this is an unsigned character. Eh, it doesn't matter. But we're going to say our buffer is a string that we're writing to the, the screen. So I'll say we're going to loop through the string that was passed <laughs> to write. And we'll have other stuff that was in here. What else did I have? Font character, bytes per character line. Frame buffer, we probably do need that, but I'm going to calculate that dynamically later, but that'll be there. We are going to take similar things to what we have here, but I'm just going to copy the code first. We're not going to go to return. Um, and I'm also going to shift it over by one. So we're going to go through multiple things in a string. So looping through our string here while we're not at the end of it. Well, we're not at the length passed in, and we're not going to print a null probably, so we'll stop early if needed. Actually, let me do this. If we're going to return from right the number of bytes written, and we're going through the string with i, it might not be exactly correct, but I can just, <laughs> as a default, pass... pass I back to the caller for this as an easy return value. So I'll, I'll do that. Um, that'll be at the end. This will be number of bytes written. Okay. So I less than the length that was passed in and string I is not null. We're not at the end of the string. We'll iterate through here, so this should be there, yep, okay. So if they passed in something that we need to uh, change these variables, basically, I <laughs> guess I'll have those be here. Persistent, terminal variables, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this, affected by, changed by, affected by, control, escape, sequences, fancy. This will be right length bytes from buff to screen. 
Okay, so our control codes, our control escape sequences, I guess I'll put in here. However you call it. Um, I was doing some research, which takes me forever, but if you go to the page here, this is for VT100, just ANSI escape codes. It was just one thing I found that explained some of them, uh, which made sense in the ASCII list. For the, con the control characters, if you type something in, like at the terminal, sometimes you'll see these. And that's literally just offset from 65, kind of, which is the, the capital A, right? If you go down to 65, no. Oh, that's in hex. I want it in, yeah, 65 in hex. You know, these are just the capital letters. So the control codes start there just for, I guess, easy remembrance for the caret notation. Uh, but we're going to be using escape, so starting with 27, which is hex 1b. Yeah, rock 33, it is escape. So if you ever see a caret left bracket, that's because you're doing escape codes sent to like the terminal. And I'm going to use a slash e for the literal escape character, which all that is is going to be signaling hash x 1b or this caret thing. But yeah, we're going to use that as the escape code character because that's just what people use this escape character. So for like VT100, you can send escape and then a left bracket and then a value for X, semicolon value for Y, ending, in, ending with an H, and that will set the X and Y sort of cursor position, or at least the home positioning. I think it just moves it. Um, if you do just left bracket H, it does home. So these things, you know, move the cursor around. I can erase text to the end of line in different ways. You can change if stuff's bold or reverse or High intensity, as my work calls it. Uh, setting the foreground, background color. You know, this this kind of stuff. So escape codes. So I'm going to do similar things, but they'll be less and a little bit simpler. <laughs> um, but that's that's what I'm going to do here. Supported escape sequences. To start with, do slash E. or slash x1b, or slash 033, okay, etc. And for mine, I'm just going to end explicitly with a semicolon. Just visually, visually it'll be clear. We'll set the cursor position, and that will be slash e, x, you know, number, y, number. These will be up to 32-bit numbers. So I can put them in a string, that looks better. I think, I mean, you can do these different ways. I could say cursor X. It's just how many characters you want to read or compare against in the strings. So if I just do X, Y, it's a little bit shorter. So we'll, we'll have something to set the cursor position. Could do this as well. Um, do that, okay. Something to set the foreground and background color. Let's say foreground number, background number. Sure. I'll have something to clear the screen. And set x, y to zero. So clear the screen and set the cursor to the top left effectively. I'll have something for that. An escape sequence, and that will be CLS. Sorry, I forgot I was ending these with a semicolon. <laughs> That'll be CLS. We'll just do that for clear screen. Oh, turn the cursor on and off. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, or set cursor visible or invisible, I think it's called for like the ANSI terminals and things. But we'll say turn cursor on and off, sure. This will be E, and we'll do cursor on. Or maybe cursor O, or cursor yes, cursor no. I don't know. I'll do on. And we'll say off be off. I had one more for a backspace, I guess. So we'll do this backspace. So this will move cursor left by one and erase erase character at current position. I guess that might sound kind of backwards, right? So we're going to erase the character and then move back left, but it does both, so I don't know. Anyway.
just to fit it all on the screen there. Uh, backspace will be... Um, we'll do backspace, <laughs> I guess. That's fine. That's easy enough. And I can I can add other ones later. That's that's fine. Just set these as like notes. These are important. Look at these. That way I have it in documentation. So that's good. I need to write more documentation at work and in life in general. So <laughs> we'll have those there. So when we're reading the string, I haven't changed this stuff to be correct yet, but when we're reading the string, if we encounter that escape or the x1b, I think this counts and compiles, but I can check right here. It's just Vim marks it wrong. Mm. Yeah, that counts because that doesn't get an error. Okay, but I'm I'm going to just say x1b because that doesn't give me an error in, in Vim. Found escape uh, sequence. So we'll do that stuff here. Else we'll print the character. Or well, what we can do is just continue instead. We'll do that. Okay. Go on to next character string. Uh, but we'll have stuff for that. So printing, we want to be similar to what we were doing here. So it's not, it won't be in character, it'll be string i. But instead of needing these as well, we have these available. <laughs> Compiler literals. So that's a little easier to, to reason about than 0x0a. If it's a line feed, we want to increment this thing. So what do we have? Y instead of that. So we'll have Y and it is not a pointer. It is just Y. And we'll say if that is greater. Of course, if we're incrementing anyway, we can just do this. That's a little less. If it's greater than the font height minus one. We're at the bottom of the screen. We want to copy things. These should still work the same, except this will be, we'll do this. So I'm going this, I'm going the C way with terse variable names and code here, which isn't great. That's all right. And instead of going to return, we'll continue to keep the for loop going. Lots of string I is a carriage return, which is R. Then X will be zero. And we'll continue. Okay, I could use a switch statement instead as well. I'm seeing that would be probably better. Uh, this is font W. This is font H. In character, nope. It's back, string I. So this is porting, right? <laughs> this is rewriting the same code, which is not great. But I did stuff a little bit differently here. And that I got the frame buffer at this point. So before I write the character, I get the frame buffer because that's kind of how it was set up in the print types function. Right, I get the frame buffer, the frame buffer position. Really, I don't need it until I'm actually drawing a character. Um, but I get the frame buffer position anew each time when I draw a character. So that's why I'm putting it here. Um, that's a pointer to the physical mode base pointer, which I could have copied this stuff over, <laughs> but I didn't. Um, and we're going to add a couple things to that. So Y times the height times the amount of pixels in the line. And however many pixels that was, they each take up bytes. So bytes per pixel as well. And we'll add the same thing for X, which would be font width. Except we don't need the X resolution because we're already getting that with the... Taking care of that with Y. So, you know, the standard sort of Y times the pixel stride plus X sort of deal here. Figure out the position at which we're going to draw the character at. And then this code is mostly the same. Except I want to call this pixel drawn instead, just because... It's a little shorter to write, 
And if this is incremented before here, I can do this and save a line. Make it slightly more terse, but not too much. So instead of doing this down here, I can move this check, since it happens at the end of the loop, I can move this check into the loop to terminate it. And we're stopping at font width down here, yeah. So the number of pixels that we draw drawn, as long as it's less than the font width, which is in font W, then we'll keep drawing. Otherwise, we go through, we decrement the bit count, and we'll increment the pixel drawn. So when it equals the font width, the loop will end and it'll break out of that loop anyway. And then it should end at that point. And it'll be reset to zero up here anyway, so I think that'll still work. Um, you know what I should do is just mass replace all of this. Let's do that. That replace everything? Yep, yeah, okay. There we go. Find and replace. I guess I could do that for cursor X and Y as well. Might as well. Except these will not be dereferenced because they're not pointers anymore. This is not 80, this is X limit, which looks a little bit better. Um, this is incremented anyway, so we'll do plus, increment it first. And the same thing here. Line feed at bottom of screen. After we increment, we'll go down, we'll copy them over. Okay, turn number of bytes. Okay, so that's not bad. And actually going to the limit, we really just want to check if it's less than the limit, otherwise we'll set it to zero. And that all looks good, but okay, after we draw, what I could do, this is less efficient because I'm going through this code every time, but instead of having a separate thing to draw the cursor, I'm just going to automatically draw it at the end if it's set to true. This show cursor variable. Um, so here, so if show cursor, <laughs> if not, then it won't draw it, right? Um, or what I could do is draw the character and then underneath the character, draw the cursor or not. And that may simplify some logic for removing the cursor on backspace and pressing enter and stuff. I'm not sure. That seems like it would be a little bit better. So I might do that, actually. So again, not, a, not as performant, but I think this code was similar to... I don't have it in there, actually. Similar to the cursor drawing, which is in screen... Cursor... The move cursor, this stuff here. Um, we already have the bytes per character line up here, right? Yeah. The size... So font character would change because we're doing the cursor character, which I have at 127 explicitly. And my fonts right now, that'll have to change later for the character, or if we want to get it dynamically or change the cursor or something, but right now it's just a line at the bottom, and that's at position 127 in the font files. So um, that should be minus whatever's over here, which is bytes per character line. Instead of character size. So replace that. Then we have to re-get the frame buffer. Actually, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have to re-get the frame buffer because it's already there, right? On the screen, after we draw the character, well, if we incremented for the next character and we draw a character on the screen, I'm trying to think. <laughs> if we're drawing like, you know, if we drew hello, the cursor is going to be after the O, right? And it'll be a line at the bottom. So I was trying to think, I was like, is the cursor going to be at this position, or is it going to be one after whatever we just drew? And it, it should be one after, because we're incrementing right here. So okay, it'll be at the end over here. Okay. But what I'm trying to get at is if I have to re rerun this, like, do I have to get the position again from the frame buffer? I don't think I do. So I did in testing, but that seems like I don't need to duplicate that. Uh, what I do do <laughs> is have to go to the last row of the character because it's a full character height and size in the font file but the cursor right now only takes up one line at the bottom so it'll just be last if it if it was a full block like i have this white block here 
And then if we drew over everything, I would need to like reverse the colors or something or else the character would be erased. It would just be like a white box. So I don't have that. I just have a line at the bottom. So I don't have to worry about that. I'm just drawing one line of the uh, of the font. Um, but we'll just copy this over here. And erase that. Okay. And again, we'll do this stuff. Since, yeah, that was within this loop scope. So this will be, I guess, outside of it. That's all right. Or I could do what I did before and say, and pick strong less than font width. Then I don't need to do this. So I'm doing a lot of assuming that this stuff will even work, uh, which it probably won't. Oh, I don't have character size. Nice. Nice. I did over here. It's just a UN8. Let me put that, I'll put it under there. Okay, undeclared identifier font height. I thought I got, oh, I put it in the cursor code. I was like, I thought I replaced all that. Yeah, I did. But I didn't replace it there. And I did font W right there. Okay. Um, Size. Oh, that's probably length, isn't it? Interrupts this call. Do I have that here? Buffer 2. Yeah, I'm in right. This is length, not size. Uh, oh, one more, one more closing paren, one more closing statement. Invalid L value. Disgusting. What do you mean invalid L value? Oh, because we're writing, so it's kind of like EAX equals the result of this, but why? So that doesn't work? That's really lame, but that's okay. We can move percent zero into EAX. That's fine. And we'll have that as input to this function. That's fine. And then it works. All right. So I know we're not calling anything yet. It's a lot of setup. I'm just checking if things still compile <laughs> and it still boots. <laughs> so we're not doing anything. I mean, eventually I want to change all this drawing to be uh, using the standard IO stuff to simplify it. But anyway. And again, I'm assuming. So I'm assuming the cursor drawing works in this. I'm assuming the character drawing works in this. I'm also going to assume that getting escape sequences works. And if we, if it does, then I want to do some stuff for that. Okay, the escape sequences here. Um, let's do I++. We'll say if the string after the escape, we'll say if it is the cursor position, so the X number, Y number. So if it's an X, I want to get that number and then the Y and then the number for that and set the cursor variables to draw it. So we'll do set new X, Y cursor position. I'll start it out at zero. So by default, you could just send, you know, X, Y and end it. But I think when I use it, I'm going to put zeros just to make more sense to me. But you could, with this code, you could just send x, y, and it would put it to zero, zero. I'm just going to have a for, we'll have a while loop while. This could be a for loop, I guess. It doesn't matter. So while string i is not equal to y, so I'm also assuming we have perfect input, which is not great, but <laughs> if we start with an escape literal, I'm going to assume we're going to put a y if we have an x. So until we reach that y, um, I need to set the number that the X position is going to be at. And I'm going to do that by just setting the next digit of the string. So I'm going to, going to do A2I, sort of, which I guess I could call A2I, maybe. Maybe I'll change it to an A2I call later. I didn't think about that. Um, but we'll just add the next digit of the string, which is going to be the character and converted to numeric from ASCII will be subtracting 48 or character zero. So converting numeric to ASCII, we would add 
but ASCII to numeric will subtract it. So if we passed in the character five, we subtract character zero, we'll get the, new, the number five, right? So, so yeah, we just do that and then I plus plus, or I could even put plus plus I in here, I think that would work as well. And then we'll do the same thing for Y. Except this will be until the end of the sequence, which I'm ending with a semicolon. Yeah, explicitly. So we'll just do that. And OK. So if they don't want to set the cursor, maybe they're doing something else. Maybe we'll clear the screen. So that is more than one character to start off with. Or I can, I can explicitly check a C, then an L, then an S, right? If I wanted to do something like this, clear screen. Or I can just string compare if they sent the whole thing, which means I need string in here. Okay, so including string.h. So if it was successful, I'll do not string compare the address of string i, because if we just sent string i, that is a, uh, a character, because it's taken dereferencing the array offset by that. So the address of string i. I will compare, and I should be the character after escape. So if the full string was this, then we should just need to compare to this. So one, two, three, four. Or even just CLS, really. But I'll include the whole thing. Need another one. Okay. So a clear screen to background color and set. Cursor X, Y position to zero. Okay. So I have a frame buffer, but I could get another one here. <laughs> That's what I did in testing. So, okay. I just had another one. Inefficient. I don't realize that I duplicated things until I like look at it later. So that's kind of funny. It's not funny, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> But I might, I, I might could just remove this later and do this, right? That would probably be better, because we're going to get it down here anyway. So that's fine. But yeah, we'll just reset it to the start of the base pointer, because we're going to go through the whole screen and write all the pixels to the background color. So I think I just copied the clear screen code here. Like this. I think I just did this. That's what it looks like I did. <laughs> Except I called it background color, because I'm using that as the variable here, up here. Yeah, background color. Okay. So I'll get rid of that. And then we'll just set X and Y to zero. And skip the rest of the string. Okay, so up here with the X and Y, I'm going character by character until we reach the end. And I will equal semicolon with the, when this ends. So the next iteration of the loop, it'll skip past the end of the escape sequence. Um, for these other ones, I'm not doing that. I'm doing string compare. So I need to increment to the end of the string so that the I++ in the for loop properly increments past the end of the uh, escape sequence. I think I said that right. So yeah, <laughs> this is four characters. The I starts on the C, so I have to go one, two, three. And then the next I++ will go past that. Okay. Let's see if... We're doing whatever the next one is. Um, we can do set foreground background color. So I did FG number, BG number. Let's see. I guess I'll, I guess I'll just do FG then, or F. I guess FG. I did not finish this one in testing, so. Flying by the seat of my pants here. Set new foreground. And background colors. So I is going to be on the F. So the number is going to be past that by two characters. So let me do that I plus equal two. But I guess if we're going to do, do it, if we're going to be looping through the number, I can do that here. So just for contrast to this, because I don't like being consistent, I'll do this in a for loop and not a while loop. String i not equal the b, so the start of background, i++, plus plus. Um, foreground will equal 
They might put it in hex, actually. If it's in hex, then this will be a little bit more difficult. So let me let me do something for that here. Let's say. I'll do this first. Go to start of foreground color number. Or really, instead of doing a string compare, if we want to do it a different way, I can say if string i is like zero, <laughs> and i plus one is x. So if it's a hex number or not, basically, we'll say we're only supporting hexadecimal, not octal. Uh, kind of hate that it auto fills in the comment on the next line, but okay, hexadecimal. So all that would really be doing is we have to skip past these numbers. Okay, otherwise it just changes the base that we're doing, right? So I might could do that. We'll set the base equal to I don't know, we can do zero. Well, yeah, we'll just change it for each one. We'll do this and we'll set base equal to 16. Otherwise decimal, we'll do base equal to 10. That way I don't need two whole full, two full whole different loops. I don't know what I'm trying to say. And I'll just do the while again, while string i uh, not equal b, not equal to the background. I guess we'll still need a loop for foreground and background, but not two separate loops for each base. That's what I meant by that previous rambling foreground color, which I can reset here. So that will equal previous color, which is not FG, it's foreground color. Uh, times the base. Uh, I can't do that either. <laughs> I have to do another thing. Uh, that's okay. I can just have a string of digits, right? Yeah. I know I already, I already have like a type conversion file for this, but I can just have the string of ASCII digits and compare it. No, because that would be numeric. If we're given a string zero to F, I need to translate that into a number or zero to nine. Zero to nine is easy, but A through F is not. So what I could do, <laughs> include a tertiary thing. Oh, that would be lame. I could do that though. I wonder if that works. Can I include nested expressions here? Get rid of that. And string i less than equal to f. So I would want to subtract a in that case. So if this is true, then I'd want to add... <laughs> I'd want to add a, or 65. If it's false... <laughs> Actually, I want to subtract. If it's false, I'd want to subtract 0 or 48. So can I do this? I think maybe if I surround it with parentheses. Terrible code. Terrible code. <laughs> Undeclared identifier. It's right up here. Base. Um, well, if it's just going to be this times base, we'll just do times equal base. And we'll do, no, it needs to be what I did up here, times 10 plus the thing minus zero. Okay. So we'll do this, foreground color, yeah, times the base, so we need to add string i minus this. Why doesn't it say, why doesn't it like where base is at though? Base is right here, dude. It's weirding me out. Is something weird with the, uh, the scoping rules here? Oh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's why. Where is this going? That's going up there. Yeah. That's the whole reason. Okay. 
Yeah. I need another one. No. Yeah. Where does this elsive go? Down there? Oh, I don't want that. Oh, I put a I put a semicolon there. Wow, I'm blind. Why didn't my compiler tell me I put a semicolon there? Come on now. This one should be up here. Yeah. Wow, it's like I can't program C. Expression result unused. Writing terrible code. But it compiles. That doesn't mean it works, though. Uh, okay. So FG color times base. And we want to add in this. I thought I could do that. We'll get that one-liner action. I bet you it won't work, but still. <laughs> do that as well. So then we reach the B. So once we reach the B, we want to do the same thing for the background color. I have not tested this at all, so I don't know if this works, and it looks... Eh. <laughs> Looks all right. All right, so background color will end with that. So I'm taking this thing here. So FG number, BG number, okay. And I could do the number for X and Y as well with doing this stuff. I just assumed that they'd be doing a decimal for that. But I could do the same thing with the base for that. So maybe I'll do that later, but uh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> All right, what other nonsense are we going to do for escape codes? Cursor on and off, is that what else was here? X and Y, foreground, clear screen, cursor on and off, and backspace. Let me just copy this. So cursor on is going to be cursor on. It will be on six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Turn cursor on, and that will just set show cursor to true. Wow, look at how easy that was. And we'll add 6 minus 1, which would be 5. Skip rest of escape sequence. And we'll have the same thing for... Same thing to turn the cursor off, except it will be... Eight characters, and this will be seven. This will be false. Um, that's not eight, is it? This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I can't count. That's why I have notes and diffs. <laughs> and then we have backspace. That's just BS. That's just BS right there. So we'll do X minus minus. So to move it left by one. And then I want to erase the character at the current position. So that will be moving left by one. And then I would need to write a character for space two times. So maybe I should abstract the space or the, the character drawing stuff. I'd have to pass it X and Y. <laughs> Oh, I didn't want to do that. That's okay. Uh, I might do that in a bit when, I sh when I'm assuming that this stuff works. Just do extract character drawing to separate function and call it here to print two spaces. Okay. And then move cursor back two spaces afterwards. That's kind of how a backspace would work if we had garbage here. If we wanted to do a backspace and the cursor was here, we'd move back one, erase it. If the, car if the cursor was drawn after, then we'd have to do a space two times and then move back two times. And then we'd effectively erase that character and done a backspace. That's why that... I'm just writing out that logic for later. That's all. Let's do that. 
So I actually need to make the file that calls this thing and then run it somewhere and check that it works, right? So let's do that. I don't have an IO file, I don't think, do I? No, okay. Standard IO, how far are we into the video? I've been recording for over an hour and a half, so I'm gonna assume we're at least an hour and 30 minutes into this. <laughs> we're finally getting to printf. Next. Okay, so we can write this standard IO file here. Um, as I said a while back, I think this is going to be using write or the write syscall. So I'm going to put that in here. I'll just do the syscall wrapper for write. That's easy enough. Um, so what I'm planning to do with this is kind of have it like some example I saw for XV6 Unix. Uh, this takes a regular character, and what that did was just pipe everything to a, a put character function, which just writes to the right syscall. Uh, one, and the address of C, and one. So we're writing to standard out, you know, the address, a buffer, <laughs> which in this case is a single character, and the length of that is one. So that's all we're doing there. Well, at least this example for this stack overflow post on XV6 going through all the writes, this calls and everything. You know, it ended up, it calls write and all, and it goes through this stuff. I think I had a different page, though. It goes XV6 printf. I was just looking for examples, and I saw this. So this might not be the official one, or it might be, I don't know. It might just be this guy's fork of it or something, but it just has a, a put C function at the top. And then everything is piped to that, basically. Well, not piped is the wrong word, but it's just called to write everything one character at a time. That's kind of what I was <laughs> started with, just because that was one of the only very small examples I found that did a printf. Um, other than that, for the write syscall stuff, I didn't want to put in everything just yet because it goes through like eight levels of indirection just for... Just for a simple write to the screen or to a serial device. And uh, yeah, I didn't want to do all that. But anyway, the, the printf just basically everything ended up as calls to put character is why I have this here. You can also do put s. So if we have put character, we can put a string as, as well for the standard IO here. Character pointer string. Which is just going to be uh, putting the character at S. <laughs> Simple enough, although I guess this could be putting the character and then incrementing. I'll just do this, that's, that's fine. Okay. Um, but our printf, I'll have a couple functions to print an integer. I guess this would be printf string or something. So what, what I did in testing is separate out decimal and hexadecimal printing, but the XV6 example had them both as one, so maybe I could do it with them both as one and cut down some duplication. So, so print single character, write some stuff here, print a string. So these are very inefficient because we're just going to have a bunch of calls for each single character. So we can't really use this along with escape sequences either with control codes. So a good improvement would be having a printf that I guess dynamically allocates like a buffer to put the string into to then call to write for like one final write call and then printf can replace the percent %d, percent %s, whatever with the string equivalent after getting the value from the stack and putting it in there as ASCII and sending like the whole overall string with all the percent strings converted. Like that would be a good improvement for printf, but this is just going to be calling put C repeatedly very inefficiently. But it's for eh, learning purposes, I guess. Uh, we'll have a number, we'll say it's 32-bit. Um, so that's fine. I will probably have booleans for stuff, like if we're printing a negative number or not. So I'll start it as false, but we do need to include that stuff. Uh, and again, following the, the XV6 example, I'm just going to have 
I guess character would be unsigned character. Um, I'm just going to have, following their example, a small like buffer here for a number. I'm assuming the number is not going to be beyond, with a negative sign or 0x for hex, um, not going to be beyond 16 characters. So if we're doing a 32-bit number, it can be, what, 10 characters long? Well, it's four, four like billion, right? So four, zero, 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 zero. That's like seven. And then eight, nine, if we want to do hex and eight Fs, that would be 10 characters for a max. So 16 should be more than enough even with a negative sign. I think we'd only need 11 or 12 characters, but I don't know, 16's a good even number, I guess is why they chose it, so. What do I know, right? Not much. So I had an I and I had N. I guess N was gonna be the number. So we're passing in a constant, but I'll have our own internal version of that. So if it's a negative number, the negative will be true. And we'll have a negative number that we're going to work with. So if we're printing out a negative number, um, I'm going to get the next digit of that number repeatedly. So I'll do that within a do-while loop. Although it would take the same amount of space to just do the condition twice. So yeah. there's probably better ways of doing this. That's all right. Um, buffer i equals zero. So i is our sort of buffer pointer in here, our index for the buffer. So a better name than i should be chosen, but <laughs> we're starting it at zero, but for every digit of this, we're going to store the number digit by digit sort of backwards. So I'm assuming this is decimal numbers right now. I can change it in a second, but I'm assuming we're going to be printing out the number as a string, so we need to add in the ASCII character, convert it from a number to a character by adding, you know, decimal 48, or character 0. And then the number that we passed in, that we're getting negative or positive, we're, we're getting the next digit of that number. So we get the digit, and we store it in the buffer, you know, we get the digit as ASCII, and that will be, uh, while our number, we can do divide equal 10 is greater than 0. Except if we do this, it'll say n divide equal 10 greater than 0, which will be true, and we don't want to do while true forever. So while n divide equal 10 is greater than 0, we'll chop the next digit off and store it in the buffer. Simple enough. Okay, and then after that, we have it all stored in the buffer. So if we need to print any prefix to the number, like if it's negative, print the negative sign. And then we'll add that here. And to print out the number, we can just do this while a minus minus i, or you know, the ever popular arrow, <laughs> the arrow operator that does not exist within C, but which is really i minus minus is greater than zero. I like it, I just think that's funny. It's an arrow operator, wow. But anyway, we want to we want to print everything out while we have stuff in there. So we'll print out the characters that were stored in the buffer, which correspond to the digits and the negative sign if it was negative. Since it'll be stored backwards from the start of the buffer, we print it out in reverse by where we ended up back to the start. Uh, this will be equal to zero, actually. And we'll just call put character. And we'll print it to the screen, and then we're good to go. But this would only work for decimal and not hex. So we need like a sort of base. So I'll have a base here. And I'll just default it to zero. Although I don't know, it might be we could pass in the base. We could pass it in as a extra parm actually. Let's do that. And I wouldn't need it here. And this would just be divide equal base instead of 10. And that should be fine. Although I don't know if it's hexadecimal or not. We might want to print out some stuff on the front if it is hexadecimal, or we can just print 0x in the printf string. Might want to do that, but also if it's hexadecimal, then we need to print out a through f, and we don't have that. So what I could also do is have just the, the strings for that. You know, a, b, c, d, e, f. We'll have like the, the digit strings, although I guess we could use it for, uh, for integer as well. So I'll just have this here. And this is what the XV6 example used for their printf. 
right? Or am I going crazy? No, yeah, this is what they used. And you can, I'm not making it static because I don't see why this would be changing, but instead of doing X mod base, our number mod base, uh, plus the character zero, you can just offset into this by X mod base. So if it's 10, it would offset zero to nine. If it's 16, and you passed in 16 as the base, it would be zero to 15 and we'd get the right number. So I'm going to go with that because it was, I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> So this would be digits offset by n mod base, then you don't have to add the character thing. And this will work for decimal or hexadecimal, so base 10 or 16. So I'm gonna assume that. Although it, it would work for base two as well, if we wanted to print binary, I guess. It would be zero or one, so maybe it does work for most or all integers, I don't know. Octal would be zero to eight, so I guess it would still work, wouldn't it? It'd just be zero to seven. That would be the limit because the base, the base would be eight. Oh, so this is a good way of doing that. Um, okay. And then we'll print negative, although we can't print negative hex numbers. So how would we determine if it's negative? That's why they had a yet another variable and they did it as sign. I guess you could have negative hex numbers, but it depends what you want to count it as. I'm counting this as a uint32. I can make it an int32 so we can have negative. Otherwise, it would always be positive. We'd never have a negative number. <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll do that as well. We'll have sign, I guess. I can make that a bool, though. So if sign is true, if we're taking a signed number, if we want this to handle all sort of all sorts of digits, then yeah, hexadecimal at least. Then I guess we can pass in the sign flag for a decimal, like they had, and then don't pass in a sign or have it be false for hexadecimal. That way we won't add a negative sign for hex. So okay, uh, we'll do that. Should be all we need, but I'm just going to print out character and a string and numbers for now. So can do other one, other things later. So we'll have our printf function down here, print formatted string. Uh, we'll do void, and we'll have constant character pointer format and the ellipses. Although we don't have var args, we don't need it, as I showed in the first sort of 10 minutes of this video. Um, but instead of current pointer, I called it arg pointer, I guess, for the argument. But if we want to get the current argument on the stack, the thing that we're going to check, the first one is going to be the format string, which would be not the character pointer itself format, because that would be the string. We want where the string is at in memory on the stack, so we need to get an address, the address of that string. And then this is a character pointer. I'm just going to cast that address to a character pointer so we can work with byte size operations. Normally I'd want to do like void, but then we'd have to recast void everywhere, and I don't want to do that right now, so we'll just do this. And the xv6 printf used a state variable, so I guess I did that as well. Okay. I think I just copied them verbatim, didn't I? That's all right. Almost verbatim. But we'll get to the first argument in the ellipses there by just adding size of character pointer to move past format to whatever is on the stack in these magical three dots. Uh, inside... A format... String or not. That's all right. Okay, we'll have a, a loop here to loop through the string. So we'll have i equals zero, a format i. So until the end of the string, which will be a null terminator, a null t8000. Um, this time I did do this just for less typing. So if we're not in the string, I'm, I'm probably going to change this to a bool because it makes more sense, but this is how the example I saw had it laid out. But if we're not in a formatted string, then we can check if we need to be. Uh, if the current character is the modulo sign, so if they did something like this, <laughs> we read through the string, State is zero, we reach this, we want to say, okay, we're in this string now for percent, so we want to change that here. Um, we'll have state equal percent. 
found a format string. Okay, but if we're not in that, we'll just put the character. So whatever character we're on. So we're not, we didn't find this percent sign, this modulo character. So we'll just print the T and the E and the S and the T and the colon the space till we get here. But once we do get there, we'll have the state be equal to this. And that'll be here. We'll have else. Maybe we can have different states later. I guess that's why they did this, although they didn't have it. But <laughs> we can have different state machine states later. But if we did find this, then we already set it to the percent and I incremented. So we're now after the percent. So at this point in this code, we would be at this D. So we want to check what kind of what kind of thing is on the stack. What do we want to print out? And what did the user put there? What did the caller put there? So if it's a decimal, we want to print it as a decimal, decimal integer. I should also use like different lengths, like LLD would be long, long, LD would be long, stuff like that. Right now I'm not, I'm assuming just 32 bit integers. That'd be, you know, something to add later. Um, but if we had that, then we'll call our function here, printf int. Uh, four decimal integer. And that took in the number, the base, and the sign. So the number would be dereferencing the integer. So we can cast the arg pointer to an integer pointer and take the data at that integer sized area of memory, which would be an integer on the stack to correspond with this percent D signifying we have an integer. So we'll take that data as the number. And then the base would be 10 and the sign would be one, but I'll make it true. But okay, we have the integer, we have that, we have sign, that should be all right. But if we printed it out, we want to increment by the size of that thing that is on the stack, assuming it's an integer, size of an integer. And I could do a switch here, but I'll just write it out as I had before and do that in a bit. So if we want to print out hex numbers, we'll have a percent x. That'll be an integer. And we'll call our printf int with the same thing, really, but the base will be different. The base will be 16, and we will not have a sign. We won't put a negative sign. We'll just print unsigned x base 16. And since I'm counting it as unsigned, I'll put unsigned as well. Otherwise, if it's signed, we won't be able to print out, like, all f's, because <laughs> that is a negative number. It would be wrong. And then we'll do this, and we'll do unsigned int. But as it stands, we would just be printing out like Fs. We wouldn't print out the zero X. So if I want to print that out first, I should print that out first. I'll do put S. And also this isn't the right, <laughs> the, the normal put S would also have this at the end, right? It'd be a new line. I'm not doing that right now. I might do that later. So my put S is not similar to the normal ones. Um, but I can also, you know, change that. But we will put the 0x first, and then we'll print out the numbers so that we get, you know, 0x in front. Else, what do we want to have? Let's say we have a string. String. We could just call put string for that. That's why I have that up there. And that would be dereferencing um, a character pointer. So a character pointer is a string, but our argument pointer on the stack is a pointer. So this would be a pointer to a character pointer. So that's why we need the double in direction there uh, for the argument pointer. And that would pass in to put s, which is a character pointer, and then it would put the character there and increment, okay. Which is destructive. I should probably copy this to a pointer and have this be constant maybe or something, but it's destructive right now. It's not great. That's all right. And then we'll increment by the size of that. Which I don't know if size of for multiple works <laughs> even. This might just be a regular address, but... I guess I'm just doing this to match up with double indirection here. Else, if we're going to print out a literal character, be single 
one single character. So if they put a percent a percent C, then we'll just print the character at argument pointer and uh, increment that. <laughs> Although if we want to be, you know, like these other ones and be consistent, what we could do is print the data, print the character from the character pointer, although this is already a character pointer, and then increment it by size of character, which should just be one. But, you know, in case it's not, we'll do that. Okay, and the other thing was if they have a literal percent. So if they have a double percent sign, we'll just print that as a character literal. So if they printed something like percent percent %c, when we do print f, we want to print percent %c. It would take double and just move it into 1. So we'll just put uh, c right there, <laughs> and then we'll increment to the next character in the string. We don't, have a for we don't have anything on the stack. This is just printing the character. So we just move forward to the next character in the string, which I will do automatically. So if they had percent percent %c... We would read 1%, we're in the state percent, we find this, we read it, and then I will be incremented, so we'll go to the C. So yeah, that'll work. That's a simple, simple case there. Okay, and we can add more later, but I'll do... Else, we haven't done anything. Unsupported format. Uh, print so user can see. So I'm just going to put... The percent s and or the well the percent sign sorry I'll put the percent sign and the character so if they put something like percent r then we'll print out the literal we'll print out percent and r we'll print this out so that's what they'll see printed back at them instead of the replacement for it and then after that we can reset the state because we have fully consumed the formatted string. And then we'll check again if we reached another one after. Okay, so that'll work. That should be all right. So yeah, I think to make this look a little a little better, I'll do a, a switch here. It's not necessarily needed, but in my case, I think it'll look a little bit better. The whole reason they were invented, man. This is case S. This is case C. This is case percent. And this would be defaults. Okay. Well, actually, that would be for the switch, yeah. Okay. And uh, there we go. That's not bad. That looks slightly better, I think. So I can try adding these things like to the kernel or to other files or just have examples and see if it works or not. So yeah, we can we can try that out. It'll call write, which will call syscall write, which will call the terminal write, <laughs> which is still five levels less than what XV6 has for ex for an example. I mean, that should print to the screen, hopefully, with terminal rights, implicit character positioning, cursor, rather, cursor positioning. So we'll see. I'll add this to ye old kernel and see what happens. I'll just put this here because this goes along with the S <laughs> libraries. So it looks nice. So standard IO and... I guess I'll have a example, have an example. So if we if we print using these functions and the right says call, we don't need the kernel cursor X and Y, but it also means we need to replace everywhere that these things are used and occur with the regular print types functions that we're using currently. Or else printing will be inconsistent. You'll have stuff in one position from the terminal and you'll have stuff in another position from these explicit variables being passed to all those other functions. So not not great, but we can have an example just to make sure printf works, you know, and then see if we want to replace some things just for uh, if it really makes things simpler or not, and just to test things out. I could just print it like between the boot message and the prompt or something, maybe. Right? How far down is the prompt usually? <laughs> we can see if it compiles first as well, and it doesn't. So I should probably do this first. <laughs> 
Oh, I can't set an array equal to that? I thought I could do that. Oh, maybe not. Maybe not, and I do need equal signs there. So yeah, this wasn't going to work anyway. That's okay. 27. I thought this worked if you did this. Does this not work? I thought it worked. Do I need it to be character? I don't know, man. No, expected identifier or left parenthesis. Oh, I have the type. Sorry, I'm stupid. I have the type. What did I call it? Digits? Yeah. So if you're screaming at your, mo at your monitor, I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot to put the name of the stupid type there. Uh, that's life, right? So what am I doing? Yeah, state equals. That's okay. Oh, here, this else if. Bam. I mean, I can just do make like this. I just like piping it through the shell because I don't have to read the T in the temp random file it puts it into. Rackets are not allowed to declare an array. You need it. This isn't Rust or some other language that you can declare an array like that. Go. You need to do it like this. Duh. Can I assign variable if sign is true? If sign equals equals true. If my compiler didn't catch these things, I, I would not, obviously. Now let's put C. And I've been programming in lesser languages too long and forgetting my semicolons. <laughs> Syntax errors, always fun. Not even using this stuff yet. I just want to check if my stuff works. You know? It works, say, hey, okay, we can print something like in this, in this space here. So this is one, two, three, four. Although if it's zero, it would be zero, one, two, three. So why three? I can print some example string out. I guess, or I can set it down here. At 10, I'll just set y to 10 and then we'll, we'll do that. I'll print it down the screen some somewhere. Uh, do it here. User input. Let's do this. Let's do debugging. Which again, I can set an environment variable and not have to do this. Again, I've that's the first time I set this video. I've said this before, but yeah. If I compiled with like dash D debug, and then I could check like if Define debug. This is not how it works, is it? There we go. <laughs> and then we could do this and have code in here. So I could see if this works and if, because I've, I've not done this yet anyway. That's how you normally would do it. But I'm like a lame -o, so I don't know what I'm doing and I'm not a professional, so <laughs> I do it the worst way. The worst way possible. But okay, we can test printf. But I'll also need to test the right syscall. Do I have sys wrappers? No. I'll just put it at the bottom. It shouldn't be at the bottom, but... Because it's more important. But we'll put it there. Syscall wrappers, and I could do syscall numbers as well, now that I think about it. Okay. What we can do here is we'll write and it'll be fd1, we need a string, and we need the length of that string. So I'm going to make, instead of the cursor initializing to 0, 0, I'm going to put it at 5, 10. And then I'll do like printf. Yeah, I'll do printf after. So I can't just put this directly into printf because printf calls put character as the one character at a time. So it would call it for the escape and then the x and then the 5 and then the y. And I don't have a running state machine <laughs> that I'm using in terminal right. Otherwise I could do that. Um, but I'm just taking a full string at once, not a character at once and keeping a, a running state. So I have to call these separately, unfortunately. That would be a good improvement over this current system, but... That's the first draft, right? Um, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven characters. Hard coding isn't great either, hard coding length. You know, I could do string length of this, and then I wouldn't have to hard code it, or, but it's whatever. So what do I want to print? What do I want, what do I want to test? I'll just call it 
Testing printf. Let's do character. We'll have percent %c, I'll just call it char. Char percent %c. We'll have int percent %d. We'll have string percent %s. We'll have hex percent %x. And that's all I do right now, right? I'll just do mod. Mod mod. <laughs> Um, new line. Although we don't have to, we don't have to end it with that. We'll just see if this prints on the screen or not. So we'll do a character. Let's just do F. <laughs> sure, an integer needs to be U N thirty two, but it should be converted. No, it won't be because we don't have size. Uh, okay, so I'll do U N thirty two T convert one two three. We'll need a string. Hello. We'll need a hexadecimal number. We'll do AB12. Again, 32T. And percent percent won't be anything, so actually won't, we won't have to pass that on the stack. So we'll see if that works. One, two, three, four. It might not. Probably won't. It does compile though, which is scary. Oh, there we go. Yeah, page fault. That means it didn't work, obviously. Nice. Okay, so page fault. Page faults are good. Always good, because I don't know where in the stack that it messed up, where in the call stack it messed up. Uh, which is always nice. So I'm assuming this all works. I'm assuming it's with this. So what we could do is see if it prints any of these out, or if it prints none of them out. So I can do that first. Uh, yeah, I'll just do that. Nope, prints nothing out. Okay. Is it because of the right syscall? Or is it because of printf? Probably something simple I messed up, but it's going to take me like five hours to find out. It was not the right syscall. It is with this. Okay. Which it should be taking that in. Um, it goes to percent %c. I guess we can see if it even gets to this code here. So let's do that. Don't use a debugger with QEMU, just do printf debugging. <laughs> of course. But in our thing, we could do dead B for cafe babe or something. I like doing just control alt. Oh, it doesn't even go there. Oh, that's good. That's weird, actually. It goes to printf, doesn't it? Does it not like my printf? <laughs> Do you not like my printf? Oh, it goes to printf. Okay, so we're misreading things here. Is it because we mess with the argument pointer? No. Show that it does reach there. Yeah, 777. Okay. Note of state is percents. Let's see if it even gets through. It doesn't get there. Okay. So if it never reaches this point, it never reaches the percent. So how far does it get along, if anything? State starts at zero. Is that with the put C call then? Okay, no. So let's see if it's after put C call. Is it in right? Probably is. It's in right, okay. So that is the syscall wrapper.
That is the FD, this is the buffer, this is the length. I'm passing the result back, I'm passing it's this call right, which should be whatever that number is. FD, C is the buffer, D is the length, okay. I guess we'll see if it gets here. <laughs> it's the worst way of doing this. It gets there, okay. Let's see if it gets... down here. Uh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Probably this line right here, because I wasn't, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I was just testing that out. I figure that didn't work. I knew it wouldn't work. No, it does work actually. EAX is 777. So what did I set? Well, the buffer is going to be like bupkis, but I know this font is small. Sorry about that. Uh, ECX is the buffer. 12. That's interesting. EDX should be the length. The length should be 1. So that's not right. So that's not right. And that is his output. So okay, this part, this part doesn't work. That's, that's definitely what I figured. Um... So to check A here, we can have this be ESI, would be set to this if we reach this point. I can change this code, and that's no, no problemo. Let's move into EBX, well let's move EBX into zero, which will account for this. And we'll move ECX into one. And we'll move EDX into two. That's what these will be. We'll output zero, one, and two. And then we'll see what those equal. Because that's how I had it written before. Uh, what do you mean expected right print? Oh, I need a separator. Let's just do semicolon. Otherwise, it's a run on statement. It still doesn't like that. Oh, I don't need a... Uh, sorry. That that counts as... <laughs> the commas count as arguments to this being a function, and that's not how it works. Those are just strings concatenated together, so you don't need a comma to limit it like a CSV. It doesn't work. Having a bunch of issues. This thing needs to be written as well. That wouldn't have mattered anyway. Bunch of issues today. Okay. Did it reach that point? Well, EBX... I mean, where did I halt? Right here? So you figure EBX would be FD, which would be 1, because we were passing a 1 to it. Oh, it is. Okay, yeah. Then that's 1. This is whatever. That's a buffer. EDX is 7, which is the length. Which I guess if we're only printing the first character, maybe that's correct. I don't know. EAX is 1. And ESI is 7, so I think we got there all right. Okay. Okay. So, assuming this stuff is all right. Let's return from here. Let's just see if we return from writing a single character or not. I'll make it smaller. I don't know. I guess we do. <laughs> I don't see any character written to the screen, though. Uh, it should have written it down here. 510. It did not. That's not good. Oh, this as an error, I'm going to have this be negative 1 as well, but that's separate. But I'm calling terminal right with buffer and length. as the input to this, and then we'll move that into EAX when we return. Move that value over to result. We'll return result. I didn't see anything printed out, which worries me. Unless the compiler did dead code elimination or something. Eh, it doesn't like something. It seemed like write worked, though. Hmm. It 
And by worked, I mean didn't error, but then this happens. <laughs> what is EAX at this point? What is result? Seven? Okay. Let's get in seven right somewhere. Uh, I don't like this. I don't like it not working. <laughs> I guess for the first write call it would be printing, well it's not printing a character is it? It was, it was moving the cursor and then printing a character. So I don't even know if the cursor movement was correct or not. Which is great. This one is seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I guess that did work and returned here. Okay. But this didn't return yet because we haven't printed it. Okay, okay. Yeah, it would be seven. I thought it was printing the character. I'm not doing that yet. So I just want to see if it gets back here without failing now. And this is why my testing takes me like five months to do because I don't do it the right way. And it does. So it's printf that's failing me. Yes, probably because I'm passing it this and I'm iterating through this buffer, but it's supposed to be constant or something. Is that why? But printf I know is the problem child. Passing it two arguments, passing it this, and then on the stack is an f. So f is percent %c, so it should be passing the character there and size of character. But does it get to the C? Is it printing out the C that is the issue? No, okay. But we know it's not here. Nope, okay. So, does it put any character? <laughs> No, okay. Arg. I love debugging stuff when I don't know what I'm doing. It's great. It's great and it's the best. It's wonderful. I'll just cut all this out of the video until I finally find it. Because I don't know what's going on. It has to be within the right syscall, but it is after this point. Maybe it's because I just passed a character on the stack. I need to pass like a pointer to that character or something. Maybe. Maybe that's the whole issue. I don't know if it is, but maybe I do like UNAT character test, and this will equal F, and then this will be character test. No, it doesn't work. Okay, well, I'm definitely going to cut this out of video, and I'll be back when I find the issue. Okay, I'm a, I'm a big dummy. I miss some easy misses. They just take a while to find sometimes, but let me show you where I got with this. It does move the cursor and it does print the string, testing printf. This is at position 5, y10. You know, character f, int123, prints the string hello, the hex number, and the percent sign, which, yeah, and the percent sign here. Okay. So it works, and then, you know, we'll write over it because that cursor position is in the kernel and not in the terminal file, but hey, this works now. So that's good. I don't think I even need... Well, let me test. I'm not sure I need these. They're good to have to explicitly say it's that large, but I think by default it, the compiler makes them ints, which is 4 bytes for 32-bit here, and it still works. I don't want to rely on that, so I probably will put explicit things there if needed, but um, it does work without it. Um, change printing everywhere to use printf right instead of print types functions. And remove kernel cursor variables. Just putting that there so I remember later. But okay, what did I fix? How did I get these things? Oh, grep for my stuff. Uh, syscall records I had debugging. Let me remove that. Yeah, I just commented that out because it works now. Okay. So we don't have that anymore. 
So standard IO and terminal.h. I don't use my mouse ever, so let me try that. Middle click, bam. Uh, okay, so one issue was here. <laughs> when, I, when I was printing out a number, whether we had a negative sign or we had something else, um, I is incremented because I'm doing the auto post increment kind of operator here. So I is one beyond our whole string that we're printing, which even though it's, well, it's zero, so it shouldn't really matter that much, but it did matter. And instead of doing I minus minus, instead of doing the fancy arrow operator that I was having a chuckle over, uh, you should do minus minus I in this case, or while I and minus my, or, you know, however you want to do it. But if you want to do terseness, <laughs> then you need to do the pre decrement there. Because I would be one past the end where we're trying to print. And yes, I'm programming in C, so I have an off by one error. And, uh, you know, seg faults. Those are always fun. Okay, and then for these down here, when they're on the stack, they're at an RSP, you know, value. The stack pointer will hold the address of the thing. So everything on the stack is located by an address here for C declare for this calling convention, 32-bit. So technically, everything here is going to be a pointer. So, I mean, I could do probably increment by four every time because pointers are going to be consistent. But just in case it's not, to be explicit, instead of doing character where this was just care, it worked. But printing the number after the character did not work because I wasn't moving enough bytes over in the stack. So changing that to a character pointer works. Technically, the arg pointer is a pointer to a character. So increment it by the size of a pointer. Same thing for unsigned int and string and all these others. Just make sure they're pointers, like this should be a pointer as well. Um, and then it should still work. So just a couple simple things that I messed up on. It did take me a little bit to debug, but um, it works. So that's good. Okay, I'm just gonna put a couple minutes of recording here somewhere in the video to clarify some things I said earlier, didn't realize, because when I'm talking I don't remember or think of anything that I should. Um, just did some things to double check here and print F for the size of when you're incrementing the argument pointer between arguments on the stack. And C, in 32-bit mode, these are basically guaranteed to be four bytes apart from each other. And I don't know why I didn't remember that, because I've programmed assembly a good amount before and <laughs> still do sometimes. But whatever. So instead of doing these size of pointers, that still works, but only because each pointer is pretty much guaranteed to be 32 bits or four bytes in size. So you're just going to effectively increment by four every time. And that works just the same. If you don't want to do size of character pointer, even though it, it, it's kind of good because it's explicit and matches the argument, it also, I don't know, it, it doesn't really complicate things, I think. But just if you want to be even simpler and not worry about that, you can just increment by four every time. Or you could even make argument pointer like a 32-bit, a make it explicitly four bytes, and then just do like plus plus, which is sort of how XV6 example, that example I looked at for XV6 did it kind of sort of this way. Um, so you could even do that and then just, you know, I'm already setting these things like this anyway. So I did test it with the plus four, but maybe I'll see if even this works because this would be even simpler. I like simple things. It's partly why I do C. So if this is 32-bit, I don't know if this will work. Um, <laughs> I really don't. I guess I could get, this would complicate it a lot, but get a void pointer first and then cast it. And then plus equal size of, well, we could just do plus plus here. So if this breaks, I'm sorry. There's no reason to put this example here and talk about this, but uh, this sh these should all just be four apart. So we'll see if this works or not. And it does work, so okay, we're all right. <laughs> I might go ahead and just leave it at that because that makes it even simpler. But printf works if you just make it 32 bits in size. Now, I am casting it to the address to void and then casting it to a 32-bit. Possibly this would work without casting it to void. I'm not sure. I do need the address though. I think examples I've seen before casted it to a void first to really ensure it was all right, but that seems to be working all right without. So, okay. 
And then we just increment because this is going to be on the stack after all. Character pointer for the string is going to be on the stack and incrementing past that with pointer arithmetic will be four bytes because that's the type and we can just do that. So that makes it a little bit simpler, I guess. But I might leave these commented out for now just because it, I don't know, kind of makes more sense. I don't know why I forgot about that because I've, you know, program I've programmed assembly before. I've done function prologues and epilogues. I know how base pointer and stack pointer work. And they're set up in C to be four bytes apart, usually. So you can do that. I may have been confused um, from doing an assembler a few months ago and, you know, encoding instructions for pushing less than four bytes on the stack. So maybe that's why. Although in the Intel docs, uh, if the operand size is, if, if you push an immediate less than the operand, so if you push a one or two byte value and you're in a four byte operand size for 32 bit mode, it'll push a sign extended value anyway. So that'll still work. I think the only reason this wouldn't work is if you're still in real mode and the stack pointer is only 16 bits wide and then you push an immediate value, well, that should still sign extended actually. So never mind. I don't know if there's any situation um, that it wouldn't work. Actually, this says if the operand size is less than the stack address size. So I guess if the operand size is one byte and the stack address was 16, maybe it wouldn't sign extend. I figure it would though. But it says this may result in misaligned stack pointer. So this is what I was worried about if it wasn't aligned on a double word boundary. I think the C compilers, at least Clang and GCC, handle all that stuff for you. So everything's going to be four bytes apart, but I don't know. 64 bits, I don't remember if it's eight or 16 bytes apart, to be honest with you. I think I have the other one. I don't, I only have the 32 bit one. Well, there is a 64 bit one as well. There is a 64 bit one as well. <laughs> Are these guaranteed to be eight bytes apart? Cause this is written like the other one, 16. Okay. Although you have things inside of registers according to your calling conventions, that's not guaranteed. But I guess they're 16 bytes apart. But anyway, for 32-bit, they're going to be four bytes, so you don't have to worry about it that much. So I just overcomplicated things, and I forgot about that. I wanted to clarify that because I'm my own biggest critic, and I would have been upset, and I would have wrote a comment if I watched this, be like, isn't it kind of like this? Well, you know, I read this, but... Anyway, I can't catch all my mistakes, just a lot of them. So there's probably still like 10 other things I did wrong that I haven't caught yet, but <laughs> I just wanted to clarify the stack stuff. You don't need to worry about it that much. Um, anyway, at least for this simple 32-bit example, but that's all I got. I'll splice this in somewhere in the video. So yeah, thanks for watching so far. Is there anything else I want to do today? So I could end it here. I could try to replace something in some program using printf. So you don't, so you actually do believe me when I say it's simpler, maybe like the calculator here. And when I say simpler, I mean less code. I guess I'm doing includes. Uh, I don't need to do that. Actually, we can just do this, get rid of it, bam. Okay, so standard IO, I'll replace print types. So we can see where this fails to compile. And it's only in like four separate places. That's not bad. Print character. So here, let's just do a put C. And we'll have the cursor show by default, I guess. Does the cursor show by default? That's a good question. I don't remember. It does not. Let's set it to true so it shows by default. That means it'll print on the main screen in the kernel, but that's fine. That way we don't have to do move cursor because it'll automatically print. So that makes it simpler. We can just turn it off when we need to turn it off. Uh, print string, we'll have this be print F and the error message. And that'll just be a string. That error message will go into there. I guess I could do per, percent S error message for a string, but uh, by default, it'll just print it out as a string if this ends up being the value of this variable. So I don't think we need percent S here, but include it there anyway. Uh, just to be explicit, percent %d we do need, because this would be a number. So we'll print out the number. And print new line, we could just print out the string, the new line string, carriage return line feed, we won't need that. 
So we'll do that here as well. And we don't need this anymore. Of course, it might print the cursor out at the end, but we'll see. And clear screen, I think, should work and be all right with this. We could change clear screen as well to use, like, the escape sequence for clearing the screen. Yeah, but see, now that the cursor prints, <laughs> the cursor prints everything. And it's down below this, which is very interesting. I would want it to be higher up. So I think the cursor is in the wrong position for a terminal, but you know, that's good to find out. Uh, the calculator does work though, so maybe not. No, that prints over here. Oh, I didn't reset the cursor position. Yeah. But it does print out. So that is other issues. And we have move cursor, so we don't need these anymore. We don't need the explicit variables for cursor X and Y, and we don't need to move the cursor because it's going to be on by default. So remove these. I like removing code. Remove cursor. Oh. Yeah, I have remove cursor. So I should do the right syscall, which means I need to include that. This is called wrappers, and it would be cursor off, which would be eight characters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But we need to print something out after we remove it, so we need to do something there, right? I think. Well, we'll see what it looks like. We also need to set the cursor, so let me do something else while I'm here. <laughs> Let me change clear screen. I'll make a different. I'm going to make another clear screen. And it's going to be explicitly for the escape sequence. It's going to not take in anything. And again, we'll have to use to use the right syscall. We'll have to include the wrapper for it. Because I like duplicating code. Always repeat yourself, right? That's what you need. A-R-Y. We, we write airy code. We don't write dry code. Arid code, Airy. And that'll be CLS. And CLS will reset the cursor positions to X and Y zero, and that should be okay. So this we can replace. I don't know why I did that. Replace with that, which is in clear screen, which I have. And it doesn't like it because, yeah, I need one more. Which is four, no, one, two, three, four, five, actually. Dun, 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 dun. I'm hoping that byte value that it showed was less than it used to be. It might not be. <laughs> I would hope that it would be. Oh, I don't have the cursor. Oh, is it because I didn't turn it on? Yeah, probably. It's true by default, so that's weird. <laughs> I mean, I get, I get that, um, well, we turned it off before we parse. That's if it's the enter key, which I can do that. The enter key will be slash R as well. So I guess if it's off by default, I can turn it on by default. Although I thought it was on by being in set in that file, but I guess not. Whatever. <laughs> I could set it on. That's, that's fine. I'll just do that when we get a key, before we get a key. Seven, obviously I've done this before, I know what I'm doing, and I'm not confused at all. We'll just turn it on, on each time, on each iteration. See, I don't see it, I should see it in the top left, you would think. But when I type something, it does show up. When I press enter, that shows up. That's interesting. Of course, it could be solely due to the cursor not being in the right position, so that's probably why. So let me see where I messed that up. Oh yeah, I did change this. I don't remember if this was on the recording or not. No, it wasn't. <laughs> I'm assuming that the cursor is showing by default, so I just wanted to draw it. It should just draw the line at the bottom of the the character, right? 
Go to the last row. Maybe this isn't, this might not be correct, I guess. Oh yeah, I have to re-get. If I want to do this, I have to re-get where the character starts. So I am getting the last line correctly. But I do need to orient the frame buffer where the character starts to begin with, <laughs> to draw the line underneath it. Uh, so that's always good. I always mess something up. You know how it is, right? You know how it is. All right. Last line of character data. And that's where the cursor is. Okay. I'm hoping that shows up a little bit better. Yeah, see, now the cursor's over here instead of under everything, because before, what should happen is it draws the cursor and then writes the next character, which overwrites the cursor, and, you know, so this is how it should be. And if I turn the cursor off at the end of here, it should disappear, but, you know, I didn't, so. We go to the calculator, now it shows up in the correct spot. Press enter, it disappears, it goes down here. This is not, well, I guess that is correct because it's waiting for input, and that is where it shows up. That makes sense, okay. Okay, we're getting somewhere. That is, well, actually we did get somewhere for the calculator, hopefully it's slightly less bytes <laughs> than it was before this whole video. I don't have anything else, do I? I do in terminal. Oh, the one other thing. God, I keep having one more thing. Jackie Chan Adventure style. So we are showing the cursor here. So the whole point of doing this, as I talk over myself and don't finish one single thought, is that <laughs> I'm going to draw this regardless, but I'm not going to draw the cursor color if it's off. So I'm going to draw where the cursor would be, but I'm drawing the background color if the cursor is set off. If it's set on, I'll draw the actual text color. So again, bad for performance, but it should work hopefully to simpler logic later on. And now that we got the frame buffer set correctly, that works. The other thing that I messed up earlier was I was not incrementing past X and Y when I was setting the cursor parameters here, the cursor position. So this was gone, right? <laughs> so it was saying, while this string is not Y, I mean, that works if you go past the X. If we have X0, zero, Y0 zero in the string, you, you don't want to count X as the number. That's going to be some high number and make this very wrong. You want to start at the zero, so we need to increment first. And the same thing for the Y right here. That was that issue. Uh, okay. <laughs> but that was it, other than crap being weird, so. Oh, what else can I do, if anything? I, didn't, I don't want to change the editor this episode, because that's going to be a lot of changes, because the whole thing the editor works with is explicit X and Y variables set everywhere, so I don't really want to mess with that. But we do have an alternative now in the printf form, and it does work. It does print this at the end. I might try to make that disappear, but it does work. I can test if that goes away right now, actually. If I test remove cursor... If I remove it before writing anything, it should disappear. And we should be able to put multiple things um, within one of these as well. So let me test that. Because that would continue past. Okay, so we can put another one and do cursor off. And it should not write the cursor after all of this. And I'll just be one, two, well, I'll just put the string here. I was going to do the literal, but... That's fine. Okay, see, then the cursor disappears now because it's it's drawing where the cursor would be, but it's drawing the background color because that variable is not set to true. So, cool beans. Print F works. I do want to remove this. Also, this is a very easy thing I can fix right here. Well, not fix. It's not broken, but... Um, I don't need to put this in parentheses either. Tokens is not a type. Tokens is an instance of a type. So I can do this here, not hard code things, in case they change later or it's removed. That's the whole point of memset, to be able to make things easier like this. So we can do that. And this is file name two, and this is command string. Look at that, memset. 
So if I wanted to change everywhere that print occurred in the kernel, that might be a fair few number of places. So we'll see. We check for print. We'll just say print underscore. And kernel. Uh, we have a good amount of places to change. I mean, it's not like a buttload, but it's a lot. So I might do that on another episode or just do it behind the scenes and not record it. But I kind of want to record when I'm changing every line of code. That was kind of the whole point of the series. So what if I, how many lines is that? 96? It's not too many. But that would just be changing all these. Like this print string for the prompt, that would be like changing this to print F right for the prompt and then I set the cursor off here but I would want to set it on so this would be cursor on and then we'd print the prompt the cursor would be there so we would not have to move the cursor So does that print the cursor? It says I'm passing too few arguments. That's good. Oh, I'm passing kernel cursor F and Y, yeah. I don't need to pass these anymore because they're implicit. I would just need to pass the prompt. So I can try it both ways. We can try printing a string, and the prompt is the string. And the prompt is now after the printf because the cursor, remember the cursor position is now in the terminal implicitly. So it prints after the previous part. That is correct. But the kernel cursor position for taking in commands is still being used here. So it is kind of jank. We'd have to change all the positions for that to line up. Um, I don't have to do X. I can do zero and this will print it correctly here. And I'll print a new line after this then the prompt will be in the right place or well stuff will be stuff will actually be right here well it's doing exactly what i told it to isn't it if we printed the boot message <laughs> then it would actually be in the right place let me do this cursor off And fix that. That would have been a bug. Let's do cursor off right here. We'll print the boot message. With the menu string. We'll test print F. Does menu string end with a new line? It ends with a couple, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. Print this with the new line. Then we'll print the prompt out and just see if we get the same default look, except with the test line in there. Yeah, except I need a carriage return if I want to do that. <laughs> oh, it does do the literal new line. It's doing what I told it to. It's just, you know, I want it to be better. There we go. Geez, so much work. That's what I wanted. And then the, curse, the kernel cursor X and Y is up here because we're not using that for printing, but the prompt would be down here. Um, but also I wanted to test if we needed the explicit percent %s. I don't think we do. I think it just passes the string bytes along with the pointer. So we don't need that extra thing. So yeah, we can just do print F for strings now. And that's a little bit, <laughs> it's a little bit simpler on things. The only issue is we have extra code for these write calls now. So I would like this to be explicitly, well, I'd like this to be covered by printf. So that is a, a change maybe I'll do on the next video or something. I'd have to make printf allocate a buffer dynamically or have some size buffer that we just reallocate when needed to a larger size or smaller size and just directly copy these escape sequences in there, but also expand any percent sequences and have those be just all part of the string. Then we send one big string to write and uh, it should work. So maybe I can do that on the next one. I don't know. This video has probably gone on too, too long, but this is just showing that this stuff does work. And that is where we would go with things. So just, yeah.
I am going to remove the calls to, to this from the kernel just so we have a set thing that isn't janky in the repo. But um, yeah, I might do that on the next one. On the next video, make printf actually send the whole stream and not have to separate out printf and and write calls to mess with uh, control things for the terminal, maybe. Um, if I do that, I'll show that. If I don't do that, something else I want to do is um, here where we're calling programs, if it's a C program like the calculator or the editor, I want to pass in parameters in here. Like, you know, main normally in C takes in int arg C and character arg V, which is a buffer, so I put a buffer here. Don't hate me. This is less the type by one character, but I don't really care. Yeah, so maybe I'll do it to where I, I set these up. If I'm calling with the command string in the shell, and I have multiple flags passed with a dash or something, or just multiple things in a row, which I already do for the rename command, for example. Here. I'm taking in the tokens. I would probably make the tokens better so I don't have to do this crap, but <laughs> um, I'd write a better tokenizer. But we have the things in here. So I can pass those, yeah, I can pass those, capture them inside of an argument vector for strings and pass those strings, that argument vector, a pointer to that array of strings called argv. I pass that pointer argv to the program. And then argc can be the number of strings in argv. So I don't think that would be too big of a change, especially since it would be isolated to the kernel and not other stuff. So I might do that on the next one as well. We'll see. That's what I'm thinking about. I also do want to do the... Uh, the file system rewrite and a big, that'll be a, a large changes to everything. So I'm still researching that. I've done some, some small tests and things, but it's not, I don't like where it's at yet. So I've been kind of procrastinating, <laughs> but I wanted some video out. And, you know, I'm not trying to pad these out, especially this one. I'm not trying to pad this out to like three hours. It's just literally, no matter what I do, I'm destined to somehow fail at making things short and I talk too much like I'm currently doing. So fingers crossed the next one could be shorter, <laughs> but yeah, that's how the basic write abstraction. That's not how write should work. I'm just hard coding a one going to a function, but you know, basic abstraction for a write syscall and a print F at a simple enough level. So we capture and change parameters such as cursor position Colors, which I haven't shown, I'd, I'd probably replace the change colors command with calls to write to change the foreground background colors. I can do that. Um, but yeah, stuff like that we can we can pass in to a, a terminal driver file, if you will, functions for that. So we don't need to explicitly keep track of kernel X and Y positions anymore. And that's all I'm going to do on this video. It's gone on long enough. So thank you for watching. Appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.